Good afternoon, everybody. I am so excited to have you all join us today for an update um, and report briefing on PCDC's report looking at primary care access and equity across New York City Council districts. Today on this webinar for the next 45 minutes, um, we have several speakers. Um, there's myself, Mary Ford. I am PCDC's Director of Evaluation and Analytics. And today I'll be joined by my colleagues, Angela Allard, PCDC's Evaluation and Analytics Manager, as well as Jordan Goldberg, our Policy Director. And we are very excited to have a special guest speaker with us this afternoon, Helen Artiega. She is the CEO of New York City's Health and Hospitals, Elmhurst, and we will be hearing from everybody throughout the call, and we'll also have time for a Q&A and discussion um, following. So I'm just going to give a quick um, kind of overview about the Primary Care Development Corporation for anyone on the webinar who's not familiar with the organization. PCDC was founded in 1993 under the Dinkins administration and really came out of a report um, on a report um, by the Community Services Society that identified that there were a number of neighborhoods in New York City that had severe primary care shortages. And these same neighborhoods also experienced um, high levels of poverty and some of the city's worst healthcare outcomes. So to that end, CD, uh, PCDC was founded. We are a um, US Treasury certified community development financial institution focused on improving community health in underserved communities through targeted investment in primary care practices to build, renovate, and expand these practices. We are also a technical assistance provider. We have trained experts that can partner with primary care and healthcare providers to build capacity, increase quality of services and outcomes of patients at these health centers. And then we also advocate and promote policies to make primary care stronger. Um, PCDC advances policy initiatives at federal, state, and local levels, to bring resources, attention, and innovation to primary care. So the report findings that we are going to be discussing today um, come out of PCDC's very own evaluation and analytics unit. In 2017, um, this unit started what we call the Primary Care Safety Net Access Project, um, sort of initiated in part with uh, funding from the New York City Council. And through this project over the last several years, PCDC has um, analyzed and made public quite a bit of data on primary care and healthcare access, health status and outcomes, and other socioeconomic and demographic data, all available at the New York City Council level. This really is a unique resource as many of these data points are not really available anywhere else, sort of cut by the council district level. And we believe that that's really important to ensure there's actionable data um, at this level. Um, so in the last several years, PCDC has published multiple reports, um, as well as created an interactive dashboard. Um, we'll be providing the links to those um, momentarily through the chat, and then as well as in a follow-up email after the webinar. Um, and today you can go to the dashboard, it's publicly available to query um, all of the measures and more um, that we discussed today on the webinar. And you can look at that by council district level, borough citywide and create comparisons to see how different districts and neighborhoods compare to citywide and borough wide averages. Our reports are really aimed to present timely information on primary care access and their intersections with health equity to really emphasize the important and kind of provide insights into placing investment in underserved communities. We also provide um, actionable policy recommendations that are responsive to the report findings. Today, we will be kind of re-reviewing or reviewing for the first time for many of you on today, 
a report that we published in the summer of 2021, as the name suggests, looking at primary care access and equity, really through the lens and a focus on um, the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the implications that the pandemic has had um, for access and equity across the city. We have summarized findings in the report and provided policy recommendations that will help support and promote access to care for all New Yorkers. So as we go through um, both the report findings, um, hear from our guest speaker and um, our reviewing policy recommendations, please feel free to put any questions and comments in the Zoom Q&A feature. And we will um, try to ensure that there's time at the end to get through as many as, of those as possible. Without further ado, I am going to turn this over to Angela Allard, again, our Evaluation and Analytics Manager, who will walk us through some of the report's data and key findings. Yes. All right. Thank you, Mary, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm trying to. I'm going to be walking us through some of the key findings from the report. But first, I wanna take a brief minute to review the epidemiology of COVID-19 in New York City. As the first epicenter of COVID-19 in the United States, the pandemic has had an unprecedented impact on the healthcare systems in New York City, as well as the health of all New Yorkers. And so in this report, we looked at the cumulative COVID-19 case and mortality rates by city council district and the data are as of February, 2021, which is shown here in the maps on the right. And so, as you can see, looking at the map of COVID-19 case rates, the top five districts with the highest cumulative case rates are the three districts in Staten Island, districts 49, 50, and 51, followed by district 48 in Brooklyn and district 21 in Queens, which is home to the Elmhurst, Jackson Heights, and Corona neighborhoods. In two of the districts I just mentioned, uh, districts 21 in Queens and 48 in Brooklyn were also among the five districts with the highest cumulative COVID-19 mortality rates across New York City, um, which you can see in the map that's on the far right. And the other districts in the top five for COVID-19 mortality rates were districts 12 in the Bronx, as well as districts 25 and 31 in Queens, which also includes um, parts of the Jackson Heights and Elmhurst neighborhoods. And as we'll see on the next few slides, and if you're familiar with these neighborhoods, the pandemic fell hardest on the districts with some of the most underserved communities in the city, where the disparities we're seeing with COVID-19 outcomes overlap with um, other inequities that existed prior to the pandemic. So the first key finding highlighted in our report is that barriers to primary care are consistently associated with worse COVID-19 outcomes. So districts where residents face multiple barriers to accessing primary care were also disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And this finding is consistent with research being conducted across the US that has been linking um, worse COVID-19 outcomes to having worse access to care. And a couple of examples of this are shown here in the maps on the right. Um, the blue map is uh, looking at uninsured rates for adults, and the green map is showing the proportion of households with limited English proficiency. And so districts that have both higher uninsured rates and lower English proficiency also had higher COVID-19 case and mortality rates. Um, and on the other hand, uh, COVID-19 case rates were much lower in districts that had more primary care providers per person. And so what this suggests is that experiencing um, multiple barriers to care is common in New York City's most underserved neighborhoods. And this is contributing to the disparities we're seeing across districts in COVID-19 outcomes. Um, and we know that access to high quality comprehensive primary care, which also includes culturally and linguistically competent providers, um, drives better health outcomes. And so ensuring that these neighborhoods have sufficient access will be a critical piece for reducing barriers as part of um, post-pandemic recovery efforts. Next slide, please. 
And so the second key finding highlighted in our report um, was that a notable number of New Yorkers are delaying or foregoing care entirely due to cost. Um, as many as 13% of New Yorkers in 2018 reported delaying or foregoing care. And while we know that delaying care was happening well before the pandemic, um, this statistic is likely to have increased substantially um, during the pandemic. And so what we found was that um, higher rates of delayed or foregone care due to cost are associated with having fewer primary care providers per person, um, as well as higher rates of preventable emergency department visits, um, which you can see in the map on the, in the purple map. And we also found that um, districts with higher chronic disease rates, um, like diabetes and hypertension, also had um, some of the highest COVID-19 case and mortality rates, um, which were also associated with having um, more delayed or foregone care due to cost. And while the average is 13% citywide, um, you can see in the map that in some neighborhoods nearly 20% report having delayed or foregone care due to cost. And so some clear patterns are emerging where some of the neighborhoods with the most barriers to primary care um, and the worst health outcomes are also reporting um, delaying care due to affordability issues. Um, and again, the Elmhurst, Corona, and Jackson Heights neighborhoods are in Queens are emerging on top here. The last key finding we wanted to highlight um, is that Black and Latinx communities in New York City in particular um, experience the most inequitable access to care. And this has persisted um, for decades despite efforts to close gaps by race and socioeconomic status. Um, so for example, districts with a larger proportion of black residents have fewer primary care providers per capita um, and also report having um, higher rates of delayed or foregone care due to cost. And districts with a larger population of um, black or Latinx residents also have the highest um, COVID-19 mortality rates. And so these findings indicate um, the need for targeted investment in primary, primary health care resources um, in order to address both the disproportionate burden of COVID-19 cases and deaths, as well as this like consistently lower access to care in districts having um, larger Black and Latinx populations. And this will very likely contribute to major long-term negative impacts and also deepening existing um, health inequities. So overall, the report summarizes several key findings and uh, data that all point to this inextricable link between access to care and other inequities for New Yorkers, where these pre-existing disparities have shaped the COVID-19 pandemic in the city. Many are expecting COVID-19 to deepen health inequities, both in terms of access to care, worsening chronic disease and mental health burdens. Um, and for some New Yorkers, new health issues are emerging, uh, particularly issues with behavioral health, which are expected to disproportionately impact segments of the New York City population. Um, and through our primary care safety net access project and other investments, uh, we at PCDC are committed to continuing to publish actionable data that shed light on the health status and needs of communities most affected. Um, the data and findings I reviewed here, again, are available in both the report um, and an interactive dashboard. Um, links are available in the chat box. And later in the presentation, my colleague Jordan Goldberg, uh, PCDC's policy director, will be reviewing several policy recommendations that PCDC has developed in response to the report findings. But before we do that, we have a special guest today, Helen Artiega, the CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals Elmhurst, who has been kind enough to join us today to shed some light on how the pandemic has affected their community um, and discuss how some of the data from the report has helped shape their response. So without further ado, pass it off to you, Helen. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great afternoon. And I really look forward for the next few minutes discussing not only how this data was used during the pandemic, but how looking forward 
we're going to be using this data that PCDC has been able to give us, not only as a hospital, but also as a community. Next slide. So welcome, welcome to this great uh, webinar. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our hospital because I want to put it into perspective why a hospital is talking about primary care, which seems kind of odd. But hopefully at the end of the presentation, you'll see why primary care is so important to us. Um, as you can tell, our hospital was built to serve. Um, we are actually this year 190 years old serving New York City. Uh, next slide. So this might look familiar, this little map here, keep it in, in mind, is um, when you start looking at the communities we serve, you'll start looking that our district is very similar to the maps that we were using before. Our community serves about all low-income communities, and we service about 38% of the uninsurable. So our community and our mission is really to be a public hospital and serve everyone that comes through our doors. Interesting fact about Elmer's Hospital, 47% of our population is farm born, which makes us not only the most diverse hospital in the city and in our zip codes, but actually the nation. We actually speak more languages than Google. Google only speaks 109, and here at Elmhurst, we speak over 125, which represents a, about 92, 93 different cultures and religions. Next slide. The one thing to remember about this slide, I know there's a lot of stuff there, is that we're a level one trauma center. So we see a lot of the, um, we're the only one in our seven zip codes that get to see this type of care. But more importantly, we see about 1.1 million visits annually. And in the borough of Queens, we only have 2.4 million residents. So if you do the math, um, if we use some of the epi and data magic that Angela has, you'll notice that one out of every adult in the borough of Queens gets their health care here at Elm. Next slide. Here at Elmer, as you can tell, we love the gold. Not only do we love the gold, but it also represents the type of quality of care we're giving our patients. One of the things that I just wanna make sure our community is aware of, not only are we COVID heroes, but we also believe in prevention. We believe in giving the best quality of care, not only because we come from a poor community, doesn't mean you have to get poor care, um, which makes us all, our mission very aligned to the mission of PCDC. Next slide. So why are we all here? I'm gonna talk about a little bit our, our two year COVID Elmer's response story. So you can go to the next slide. Like everyone else, COVID hit us like a huge tsunami. However, at Elmer's Hospital, it really hit us super hard. And um, we can go to the next slide. Within a few days, we were impacted completely. Our ED census went to 250 patients a day when our bays and our stations see 57 a day. Our COVID emissions were about 1,500, which is something we never heard. It was a new novel disease. We were also the first hospital to be a complete COVID hospital. That means 545 beds had all COVID patients. And not only that, we also had surge beds as well, which increased our number of ICU beds that we had. Um, we had about 528 of those type of beds. Our highest one day COVID census reached in April 6th with 381 emissions. And one of the main things that I wanna make sure while the tsunami was hitting us, it was hitting all of our community providers as well. If you go to the next slide, therefore it was no surprise, you know, when we started getting this data from PCDC and we started getting these reports that District 25, 21 and 20 were the hardest hit. And in the, in the heart of these districts was Elmer's Hospital. And it was very interesting to see where Elmer's kind of sat and Elmer's leadership at that time said, we will not close our doors. We're gonna open them even bigger. So our census got triple and bigger and we were able to see every person that walked through the doors. Next slide. And as you can see here, one of the things that you can see in this graph right here is you can see here's our, in, our regular inpatient and then on the yellow is our COVID and you can see how we got to a peak of 1,300, 1,400 patients admitted to our hospital here in the peak of COVID. So right away, we knew two things. One of the things we knew, we were in a pandemic before even the news hit it. Before anyone decided to make it a news story, we realized we, we were in a little bit of trouble. So next slide. So one of the things that we realized really quickly is that we needed a little help. We realized even though we are the biggest hospital in Queens, 
and we had 545 beds and we had surge beds, we needed some help. And this is where our story begins. So our story begins in three tiers. Our first tier is number one, we needed data. And we were not good at data at the beginning of COVID. We wanted to make sure, like, how do we attack this massive unknown virus? So we did a partnership with PCDC and trying to get data. And without data, we, we couldn't figure out how to best suit our patients. So one of the things that we used was this mapping or heat maps. Uh, from PCDC reports and kind of figure out what we needed. So we realized really there was a high rate of uninsurable. So what did we do when we got that data? We increased insurance enrollment because so many things were changing. There was so much access to healthcare, which we needed to get, but a lot of people didn't know. They were afraid of getting all these bills because while we love to believe in the middle of pandemic, everybody's going to be seen, patients still thought of costs. And if you can see in figure five, you can see where the patients in the communities and the districts that were delaying care because of costs. And those, and if you really look again, again, it was District 21, District 25, and District 20. So you could see Elmer's Hospital had to take a role in making that messaging clear. Another thing that we saw, which was not a surprise to us, a huge percentage of our hospital had limited English. And when we took those two information, we were like, okay, how do we reduce the language barrier? Because it's fine when the patient comes through our doors, but what do we do if they don't understand any English? How many more translations lines do we need? How many more interpreters do we need? The information that we gave back to our patients to go back home to deal with care, how do we do that? How did we reduce that language barrier? Next slide. Another huge data point that we used from the PCDC report was this whole issue of the Black and Latin, Latinx population. We use these kind of indicators and these metrics to kind of say, okay, our communities are suffering. We, we know we are the epicenter of the epicenter. We know these three major factors of social determinants. What is our goal? What do we need to do? And that's where we kind of high geared. And we said, okay, how do we get additional fundings to support social programs? How do we get additional fundings to get reduce the language barriers, and how do we increase the trust? How do we make sure our community and our community partners increase trust in our hospital so they can come back in and they can feel they're getting the care that they need to get to avoid some of these bad indicators? One of the great things that, uh, and I will tell you this very proudly, and Louise Cohen already knows this, we stole famously um, so much that we actually took some of that data and created our own dashboards. You can see here, we kind of created our own heat map so thank you so much for the ideas. And one of the, and you know, I say borrow shamelessly because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have data partners and it's okay to realize that as health professionals, sometimes we don't have all the data and we need to ask our partners who are really good at data management and say, hey, do you have this data to help us? We have an inkling of a program, of a funding source, of a service line that we might help to get our community. So next slide. So our second tier was our community partnership. So next slide. So you can see during the pandemic, whether it was wave one, where we had no idea what COVID was about, all the way to wave four, which is Omicron, where we knew what COVID does and what it was doing. It was like rebuilding a plane while we were trying to fly it. And we all had a piece to it. And that was something that was not only did we take the data, the lessons learned from sharing the data, we realized our community partners were important. And this is where we begin our journey as well. So next slide. So one of the things that we did while we were doing a, a swap debriefing, we brought our community partners in. While we started doing our planning for our surge, everything from testing, vaccinations, and inpatient care and how we were going to manage surge, we made sure that it was in our, on our webpage. We made sure that we were having town halls, that we had an email group, that we also made sure we made calls to our community partners. I know one of the things that we did in our way four, we called um, the CEO of CityMD because they're down the block. We called our Gotham partners. We called local hospitals. We called our hospitals in Forest Hills, in Jamaica. And we also called the local CBOs. And we also closed our local FQAC, which for us would be Plata de Sol at Urban Health. And we spoke with their CEO, Paloma Hernandez. And we said, hey, this is our plan. This is what we're trying to do. If you hear otherwise, or you see something on the ground, say, give us a heads up, please call us and be part of our incident command center, which is something we didn't do in wave one. 
Um, and I think those were some lessons learned and that's what really changed our story during um, Omicron wave four, which ideally I think led to the success of managing that huge surge um, the way we did. And we did it together, building the planes together in there. Next slide. So our third story um, is our legislative partners. Next slide. Once you take the data and you take the partnership of the community, we need our legislative partners for so many things, but our number one is policy and advocacy. Because without that, we couldn't start in giving a clear and consistent message to the public. There were so many things out there that if we didn't give our legislative partners this data at the beginning that I mentioned and what we were doing with each other in our partnership, we could not get into the recovery stage of Omicron and COVID. And another thing that our legislative partners did that was huge was the ability of telehealth. Telehealth has changed healthcare, not only at a primary care level, but also at a hospital level. And that was huge. That advocacy and policy change and those executive orders not only helped us give better access to our community, but also allowed us to create more partnership. So that was a huge partnership as well. Next slide. So how will our story end, right? We took our data, we met with our community partners, and now we have our legislative partners. So I really hope that if anything, Omicron and COVID, both Alpha and Beta and Delta, all of them really taught, really taught us that collectively our data share a full story. I think the primary and community data that PCBC was able to give this hospital really helped us plan way forward with Omicron. I think that was the biggest change. I think the other thing that really helps us is we can use this collective data to increase funding for New York care programs and also expanding FQ, federally qualified health center. I also, it means that we can use this data to tell our story, to grow and justify primary care for, workforce because it's important because I'm a hospital. I want everybody to be healthy. I want the people who come to our hospital to really need for, you know, who really need the care for those complex cases, you know, where they go from like surgical cases, you know, cancer treatments, like difficult stuff. You know, hospitals, we're not meant to do primary care. Our goal is to keep prevention people. And then when you come to us, it's more to, for those things that need more complex addressing. I also hope that this, whole story, really the biggest lesson learned is that we need more infrastructure dollars. At the end of the day, both hospital and primary care providers, we need to show united front because without more infrastructure dollars to our system, we can't fight the next pandemic. And will another pandemic come? Probably. Um, but I think together and together with the data and together sharing our collective story, I think there's nothing that can stop us to make our community safer and healthier for the future. And hopefully that tells you our story. Uh, thank you so much, Helen. So uh, that was incredible. And it's as distressing as it is to see the impact that Elmhurst and Corona and your hospital felt, it's really, um, moving to see how you were able to reach out and work with community partners and primary care providers. So my name is Jordan Goldberg and I am the Director of Policy at PCDC and I'm just going to talk for just a couple minutes about the policy recommendations that um, PCDC came up with when we put out this report last summer. And I just would want to note um, from the outset that these are uh, these are evolving as our situation evolves. So what we thought was the right answer in uh, the spring last year might have changed a little bit as we get into this next uh, responding to the fourth wave, but some of these things are sort of evergreen because they continue to be problems. They were problems before the pandemic, they will be problems in the future, and we should address them now and, and always. And the first is to commit to long-term investment, as Helen was saying, in community-based healthcare facilities and providers in places where we have a shortage of primary care access points and providers. And, you know, our data showed that where there was fewer primary care providers before the pandemic, that's where communities were hardest hit. And that if we have prevention and we have access points and people are able to get to care before it becomes critical, then they are, their outcomes are better. And so that can mean construction, it can mean um, you know, creative approaches to placing providers in, uh, in places that, that don't have them for, in a variety of ways. 
we encourage lawmakers to continue to think about how can we make sure that every community has access to a provider. Okay, next slide. So the next thing is affordability. There are still uninsured, many uninsured New Yorkers. They need access to quality primary care, regardless of their ability to pay, regardless of their insurance status. And so we need programs that will ensure that people in Elmhurst, in other communities that are underserved have access. There is a program called New York Care. Um, it does allow primary care for a variety of folks. It needs to be expanded and, and funded more robustly. And there is also a program that was passed at the end of last city council session to extend that program to FQHCs because currently it only applies to H&H &H facilities. That's one option and a place where we can start. Um, next, thank you. So the other thing about expanding access to primary care is that obviously our primary care and all of our health care workforce have been incredibly hard hit by the pandemic and we had shortages before. So we need to focus on making sure that we are growing our primary care workforce and our healthcare workforce and that we're recruiting interprofessional care teams from within the communities they serve to start building trust, to make sure people do have folks who can speak their languages, who are responsive to their needs and who live in the communities and share the, the values and needs of the folks that they're serving. And the final recommendation, next slide, has to do specifically with COVID recovery. One of the problems um, as, as PCDC saw it with the pandemic from the beginning was that primary care providers were not really integrated into the approach to how are we gonna address this, this pandemic that's coming down? And how are we going to ensure that our patients get the care that they need and that we understand how to treat them? And they were essentially closed out of a lot of the planning and a lot of the resources. A lot of primary care providers actually ended up shutting their doors because they couldn't pivot to telehealth because of a variety of things, including payment structure. And so it's really important that now that we've seen this like deep, clear connection between primary care and impact of COVID, that we make sure that primary care providers are loop, continue to be looped in from going forward, that they are distributing the vaccine, that they get resources to provide culturally competent education about the importance and safety of vaccinations for communities that may be hesitant. And then going into the future, that we don't have another situation where a public health crisis arises and primary care is left out. I think I would note, particularly for something like COVID or respiratory infection, primary care providers are often, if not usually the first point of contact for a patient who's having a primary, who's having a respiratory issue. And we can do a lot to prevent um, surges in hospitals to make sure that people are going to the right level of healthcare by including primary care. So those were our top four recommendations um, going through this data. And I think I'm going to turn it back to Mary. Great, thank you so much, Jordan, Helen, and Angela. Um, it's very interesting to hear all of our different perspectives on these data and findings. If anybody on the um, webinar has any additional questions, now is a great time to pop those in through the Q&A um, or the chat feature. Um, one thing that I would love to hear, um, actually both Jordan and Helen speak about um, a little bit would be, what would you say that the city council can do both to better understand the burden, um, the burdens on primary care as a result of the pandemic, and also specifically support PCPs now and in the next public health emergency? So maybe Jordan, if you had any insights, and then I'd love to hear Helen as well. Yeah, I, I'll quick, quickly res respond, but I'd love to hear what Helen has to say about that. Um, so I think at this point, one of our recommendations is that city council try to understand what did happen with primary care prior to the pandemic and, and in the first, you know, in the first two years. How was the how were primary care providers included or not included? What guidance were they given or not given by Department of Health, by CDC and other um, institutional actors? And what can we improve on? I think there are questions around information flow, uh, access to PPE at the beginning vaccination and also education about vaccination, all of which I think we need to understand in order to figure out how we can plan better for the next pandemic. So I think whether it's hearings or investing in a review of those things and making sure this is fairly important that we're not just talking to h, &H facilities and FQHCs, but all primary care providers in the city, including independent practices. And then I'll turn it over to Helen. I think one of the things, if I could humbly suggest for the city council to do 
is to really see us as a collective health system. I think um, seeing the hospitals in one bucket and seeing our community providers in another bucket and then seeing FQACs in another bucket doesn't really help us. I think, and again, this goes back into like sharing the data and saying a collective story. I think if they saw the path of how a patient from the beginning starts seeing their primary care doctor and follows all the way through to hospital care, they would see that our needs are very different. I think the ask of what a hospital needs during a pandemic is very different from a community provider. And I think that would help them, again, using data and kind of saying, okay, primary care providers, you need more training or more in-services or more access to vaccines. Hospitals, you need more infrastructure, you need more ICU beds, you know, to manage those complex cases and still taking care of the patient in a very holistic way. And I know that's not an easy ask, um, but I think there, if the pandemic has showed us anything, is that we are in this together. At the end of the day, I can't live without my community partners and they can't live without me because we are in the same infrastructure, the same ecosystem. And at the end of the day, the patient needs both of us or three of us. And I think that's what I would suggest for the city council to do. Thank you both. That's really great insight. And, you know, I think most of us working in the public health and healthcare system space know it really does take a village, not to overuse that um, phrase, um, but, you know, the pandemic and these emergency responses certainly um, emphasize how effective community collaborations can be um, informing the response. And Helen, um, we've got a question for you um, from the audience. Um, let me see if I can get this right. The question is, how was the response of CBOs, community-based organizations, and other partners at the beginning when Elmhurst um, first approached them for partnerships? And then how do you anticipate partnerships looking um, beyond the pandemic? So I wasn't here in the beginning of wave one. I got here in wave two. I just finished my first year anniversary. I came from the FQAC world, um, from Urban Health Plan, so I was there for 15 years. Um, I think in wave one, there was so much stuff going on in Elmer's that, you know, it was, you know, it was uh, organized chaos. You know, we were trying to take care of so many people in wave one and wave two. I don't know if you guys remember the pictures, you know, the famous pictures where all the ambulances were literally going down to almost Roosevelt because we couldn't get people fast enough into our hospital. Or we were so tight with space that we couldn't discharge patients or put our patients to another hospital or transfer them out that we couldn't bring them in fast enough. Um, I think we were so busy trying to do that that by the time we got to our community providers, a lot of our community providers were, had their own system and we were just trying to give them, we didn't want to be intrusive. We didn't want to say, hey, this is what we're doing. But I think the lines of all, of communications opened in wave two and wave three with data. I think with Omicron, the moment Omicron hit our doors uh, that Thanksgiving, we were like, okay, history is not gonna repeat itself. And we reached out to our local community partners. We reached out, we sent out emails. I think I spent a full three days on the phone talking to community leaders. I must have done like 70 town halls everywhere I could go to speak on how Elmer's Hospital was managing Omicron and what community providers needed to do for the vaccines and testing. Um, we even gave out our own tests. Um, we had test kits here that, you know, of course the hospital got them first and we were like, okay, who needs them right away? You know, one of the things that we worked with NICE, which is an immigrant organization here in Jackson Heights, they needed testing, they needed gloves, hand sanitizers. We shipped during the midst of Omicron, we shipped a whole like pallet to them to make sure that they, they were safe and that community was also. So I think, um, and now looking for the future, I think that line of communication has to stay constant. Um, I think one of the things I'm looking forward to is the low numbers that we are seeing here in COVID and inviting my community partners to come to the hospital so we could really work on the next stage of healthcare, which is reducing some of these social determinants of health. Because sadly, as many of you guys know, we're in the public health world you know, when people say, oh, healthcare access was so bad in low income communities and black and Latino communities, this was not a surprise to us. We knew this already, just COVID brought it out. 
And I think what I really want for the future is for us to collectively tell that story so we can get better funding for our programs and our health centers, but also money. We need money for infrastructure. Our health centers, our hospitals are old. I'm 190. Um, you know, I have some old bones in here that I need to fix to make sure that I'm ready for the next thing. Whether the next thing is the pandemic or maybe the next thing is delivering a thousand babies because everybody wants to have a healthy baby boy or girl. You know, that's what I really look for the future with my community partners. Great, thank you so much, Helen and Jordan. That's really very insightful. We have a couple other questions I'm seeing coming through the Q&A. I have one question here um, that I'm gonna point to Angela to help answer. It's about the data source for the primary care providers, but I think it might be helpful, Angela, if you could just speak for a minute or two about our data sources and sort of how those sort of come to life at the city council district level. Yeah, sure. So um, if you want more information on the data sources for each of the points that we have in our report, um, you can see it on the website and in our dashboard. But essentially we used multiple data sources um, for information on social and demographic characteristics, we use data from uh, publicly available data from the CDC um, at the zip code level. And we also used um, data available um, from the census at the census tract level. Um, and for the provider data, we used a couple data sources, um, one being IQVIA, and the other is the National Provider Enumeration System, which um, is a registry that updates and maintains information on healthcare providers across the country. Um, and we have things like address, location information, um, and information about the provider's specialty, whether or not their primary care. Um, and so we took all of this data, whether it was um, zip code, census tract, or location data, and we translated it to the city council district level. And so uh, this is one of the only, um, or actually the only report that has um, data available at this level. Thank you, Angela. And I will just piggyback on that um, to really emphasize the sort of last point Angela had there, which is that um, many, in fact, I think all of the sort of data points that um, were translated into the council district at this report and in our dashboard we're actually coming from different sources at a different level. Um, and I think Helen mentioned this as well, but sort of the idea of like no need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to these data points. And PCDC um, is definitely happy to work with, discuss, partner with anyone um, who's joining us today to think about how to access different data points, whether it's at the council district level, at a different borough level, um, as well to just really think about how we might be able to help make available more of these data in ways that are relevant um, and actionable to different organizations across um, the city and ensure that these data are really put in the hands of advocates, policymakers, and really any organization that needs them to support, um, support their work um, and particularly um, to solicit increased funding and investment in the communities that are certainly identified as highest need. So I think in the interest of time, um, I just wanted to see quickly, um, I was gonna ask my colleague Jordan if she had any closing thoughts for us today, but I definitely want to thank Helen very much for joining us and Angela um, as well. We will be um, sending out a um, follow-up email that'll um, include some responses to any questions that we weren't able to get to um, here, as well as um, resharing the links to our reports and dashboards. And here are a couple of our contact um, information. So thank you all for joining us today. And again, Jordan, I don't know if I could just ask you for a few closing words. Yes, and thank you so much, Mary. And Helen, again, thank you so much for participating in this. I would just say for those of you who work in New York City policy, either at the Department of Health, at the City Council, or in any agency or NGO or CBO that's that's working on policy, PCDC is really eager to promote policies in the city that will expand access to quality primary care for disinvested communities, for underserved communities. Um, in Across the city, there's a lot of different things that we can be doing, and we're happy to partner with 
policymakers and other colleagues to achieve those goals. So feel free to reach out to us um, to get in touch and we would be very happy to work together. Great, and thank you again, everyone for joining today. Thank you. Bye everybody.